Thank you, Bill. Bill is our most popular Zoom host, and we're delighted to have him back with us tonight. Uh, also here is Jennifer Miller, ATA Executive Director, and she's the lady that keeps all this in order and sets up our Zooms and many, many other things, and we're always grateful for her. I just want to quickly tell you about next week's program. Uh, this is Casey Jo White, a very fun, interesting, creative lady who's going to tell us about games on stamps. And she said, stamps on games. I have a feeling that this is going to be an interactive session. She's, uh, as I said, very creative. So come and have some lighthearted fun next week. And now I'm delighted to uh, introduce our speaker. Darren Chernichan is a lifelong collector who very early began focusing on the one, two, and three cent small queens of Canada, which is still his main philatelic interest. He has done some incredible original study and research on those stamps. His topical interest is Rotary on Stamps. He's a life member of Rotary on Stamps Fellowship and uh, knows Gerhard Peters, a member of our board who's president of that group. He enjoys constant plate varieties and digital philately. And we think we'll hear a bit about that this evening. He's a member of the membership committee of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada chair of the Small Queen Study Group of the British North American Philatelic Society, chair of the Digital Philately Study Group, and a director of the Northwest Federation of Stamp Clubs and its editor, and knows Eric Knapp, who's the president of that group and also on the ATA board. Darren is a very inspiring person. His personal mission is to keep our hobby alive one collector at a time. He wants his legacy to be his efforts to give back to our great hobby. I'm so pleased to introduce Darren this evening. Well, thanks, Don, and, and thank you, everyone. Uh, Bill, Jennifer, John. John, I met you with Don in Toronto and had dinner with you uh, back at uh, K, uh, at Capex uh, in Toronto in 2022. Since then, the world has changed so much. Um, the there, you know, tensions in the world still persist, and they go up and down. We've had, you know, uh, hurricanes and, and and storms in in Florida, where you're from, um, near our property in 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 Hawaii. Only about 500 feet from our property is where the fire line ended in Lahaina. Uh, um, and uh, I was at uh, Benapex three weeks ago, uh, only to be at the tail end of uh, Tropical Storm Lee. And so uh, it's, you know, if, if you don't believe in climate change, then you need to go outside <laughs> and, uh, and check things out. Um, one of the, the great things about the, the hobby which I'll talk about in, in shortly is is just uh, the, the one the one thing about COVID is that it's really brought us together in this type of format. We wouldn't have done this five ten years ago, and uh, for every door that closes, we open two. And I think philatelists are. Are, are pretty um, uh, creative about that. So uh, we need to take advantage of that and use that as another way of collaborating. So without further ado, uh, let me share the screen and uh, talk to you a little bit about, um, I think this is the one. And so uh, digital philately taking the hobby to new heights. Um, and let's just see here. That should be it. And do you see the next slide? A bunch of encyclopedias. Excellent. Perfect. So uh, I'm showing this to you because most of us, most of us in the audience today and, and at this meeting will have some form of encyclopedia set when they were growing up. Uh, this one was a uh, encyclopedia set that we collected from our local grocery store. And each month, my mom and dad would um, uh, purchase the next month's edition. And so by the end of the end of a year and a half or so, I had a full, I had basically the, the world's history curated in 20 volumes. And that was basically it. 
That's if I didn't, if it wasn't in those books, then it didn't exist or didn't happen. Um, and and if you were really wealthy, um, then your parents would get you an Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and so there was even more history that uh, belonged into our conscience. Um, but as a teen, as a, not a teenager, but as a child in grade school, at the back of the comic magazines, I actually wasn't interested in stamps, but I was interested in ant farms and sea monkeys, only to find that really the ant farm was kind of a useless piece of plastic and the ants really, you had, to, it was kind of stupid. And then for sea monkeys were just brine shrimp. They didn't have faces and they weren't smiling and they weren't lounging with their babies. And so uh, nevertheless, this is really what um, the back of the comic books are really what got me going with stamp collecting. Uh, about five of you in the audience have seen this presentation, and I, I do morph it a bit, so it'll be a little different each time. Um, what I did is I got interested in seeing that you can get a lot of cool stuff for either 25 cents or nothing at all. And uh, so ultimately... Um, I would keep looking and looking and I was banana stamps and 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 so not only could I get muscles, but I could have space stamps as well. And then um, but it's interesting to see that in these um, backs of comic books, you can see that a lot of them were philatelic uh, related um, advertising. And so that was really the way that that uh, uh, approval companies would, would reach, reach out to you. But this is the one that I chose. I chose from the Littleton Stamp Company in Littleton, New Hampshire. I, I went and sent away for my 20, 212 free stamps of the world, which I still have. I do have the magnifying glass, the stamp album, how to collect postage stamps, the watermark detector, which was just a little black piece of paper, and a little envelope of hinges. And that, my friends, was my first um, introduction to stamp collecting. And I thought I had it all. And so those were my three first tools. The stuff that I ordered from the Littleton Stamp Company, that, mind you, all the approvals that came along with it. My World Atlas and a pair of stamp tongs. I haven't even, you know, we didn't even, computers didn't really even exist back then. Uh, the, the really only computers we really knew about were possibly a calculator and what was, you know, on the Apollo's, uh, um, uh, Apollo flight series. Uh, and then as I got really more interested, I needed more hinges. Um, this really cool Canada out, um, a catalog, which really um, described Canada. And if you see, it says Canada Stamps and Stories. That is still probably my favorite philatelic book. It's just so well done. Um, and uh, I have two or three of them. Uh, I didn't realize that until I, I kind of went through a box about a month ago and saw that I had two more. And then I got an ambassador stamp album. My first relationship with a collector slash dealer was a fellow by the name of Julius Orosky. And these are my, and he was from Sarnia, Ontario. I'm from British Columbia, um, Canada on the West Coast. So he's about 5,000 kilometers, 3,000 miles away from me. And I got my first stamps on approval from him. And this is truly my first personal relationship with a real stamp collector. Never talked to him on the phone. Don't know what he looks like. I'm sure he's long gone. Um, and because this was back in the 70s. And uh, yet he really uh, was the impetus to my uh, interest in stamps. What got me about Canadian stamps was the commemorative, ser um, the, uh, um, the regular series um, and uh, here's one um, with just the color, just color and stamps to me really um, um, was amazing. And, uh, and then I narrowed it down to the one, two and three cent small queens. And uh, to be honest, that's all I collect um, for the most part. Um, I'll actually talk a little bit about uh, road around stamps, Gerhard. And, um, uh, and I do have a significant collection of that. Um, as that's my my real topical um, uh, area, but that's where I as a as a as a as a grade schooler and and someone in 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 middle school that's what I collected. 
My parents would take us to the local department stores, and I'm sure in your neck of the woods, people, um, you would have a Simpson, I, actually that's a spelling error, uh, I didn't notice that, Simpson, Sears, Eaton's, Woodward's, Hudson's Bay, and Woolworth's. So those were the main department stores in British Columbia at the time. I had some stamp, local stamp shops, and I was a member of the Centennial Stamp Club. And so by the time I was in eighth grade, uh, that's, what I, that's where I'd go. My parents go shopping on the weekends, and I'd go with them and hang out at the stamp uh, dealer's booth, a uh, little uh, kiosk at the department stores. Most of them had them. And then I put the stamps in a box. And then from 1981 to 1993, I studied in Burnaby at Simon Fraser University at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and then also Montreal McGill where I went to med school. So until I was uh, 30, I'm born in 63. So in 1993, I uh, started thinking about stamps again after med school. And uh, stamps slowly resurfaced to my consciousness. Um, I purchased this book from a local dealer in Vancouver. Um, his name is Brian Grant Duff to reinvigorate my love of the three cent, one, one, two, and three cent small queen. And then as an adult, Ron Ribbler from Florida became the adult version of my Julius Orosky, and he was one of the preeminent collectors of the Canadian small queen series. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, digital philately. So what I've talked to you so far was basically stamp collecting the way you and I have known it um, growing up. Uh, over the course of the last 30 years or so, we've gone from the Commodore 64 to a, um, a laptop that weighs about 10, 15 pounds um, and a iPhone that has more power than um, probably even the Smithsonian had at the time when people were going to the moon. So we've gone a long way uh, in our lifetime. And what I want to um, ask you is, is the smartphone and social media the death knell for the next generation of philatelists? Um, people would argue that we are not seeing um, young philatelists coming into the fold. And I'm wondering why that is. Is it because we have so much information available at our fingertips that things don't interest us to the degree that um, uh, it did before? I just think the entry point is different for the hobby now. It, I don't think it is a death knell. I think it, um, it really is an opportunity. And so uh, I think it's the platform for the next generation of philatelists, the, the smartphone and social media. So I think we need to, um, once again, look at what the technology has to offer us and use it to our advantage and also bring in people into the hobby that way. And then all of a sudden, the world shut down, but not for philatelists. And I can tell you that in the first few months after the COVID pandemic began, um, the Wall Street Journal and many other um, major news organizations were highlighting stamp collecting. Here's one, why stamp collecting is suddenly in vogue. Um, people are spending more time at home. And, and here's another one. COVID-19 lockdown fuels demand for stamp collecting. In the last three or four years, the auction houses have been doing particularly well um, in, in, in this um, um, in sort of the, the post-pandemic uh, realm of things. Uh, in Forbes, uh, COVID-19 virus affects um, uh, uh, the stamp market. And this was talking, uh, Richard Lehman uh, was talking about income investing in philately. Um, and here's one, a bit of a pun, a hobby that sticks. Stamp collecting keeps people glued during the pandemic um, and uh, in Newsday. So we're seeing a lot of, of, of um, revisiting. Um, it doesn't really, we don't really talk about the, the young hobby, the young hobbyists. But something else happened during the pandemic. Uh, we connected like never before, as I mentioned earlier. And... Um, and this really is now the, the, the gateway to the world of digital philately. And this is really accelerated thanks in part to the pandemic. And uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is to define for you what digital philately is. And I think it means different things to different people, but here's my definition. 
It's the use of commuting or computing technologies, hardware and software, to enhance the overall personal and shared experiences regarding the study of postage stamps and postal history, whether that be covers um, or other ephemera or anything related to um, uh, postal and the philatelic world. So it's basically using hardware and software to enhance our experience. Digital philately is a non-specific genre, um, meaning that you don't, you don't, you could be any type of philatelist to benefit from this topic uh, or this talk today, and it affects every aspect of the hobby. So here are some examples of some of the applications that um, we all can use or do use in digital philately: the tool to expand club and society memberships. We, many, many clubs now have websites. Uh, ATA has a website to, um, to promote membership and to uh, uh, provide uh, a learning platform, such as this, the recording of the session today. Digital exhibiting. Uh, sometimes uh, with, with borders, shutdowns and everything else, it's very difficult to send original stamps to a show. And, and many, many exhibits now offer a digital um, opportunity as part of the uh, exhibition um, menu. Research. Um, the use of um, databases, for example, uh, sharing databases uh, from people worldwide is really important, especially when you're doing census bureaus, which is at the bottom of this option or this list. Selling and trading, um, uh, for example, eBay, or just even sharing images of what you have when you want to trade with other like-minded collectors. Helping organize collective collections using your own um, uh, ways of, of, of making pages, or you can organize collections using a database. Uh, you can uh, organize collections using a, a pre-purchased pre um, populated database. Uh, digital philately includes writing articles and publishing, sharing and collaboration, uh, journal um, uh, writing, and also presentations such as this one. So let's talk first about the tool to expand club and society memberships. So local stamp clubs, such as the West Toronto Stamp Club, uh, has their own website. Regional societies, such as BNAPS, the British North America Philatelic Society, Pacific Northwest Regional Group, uh, national and international organizations, including the ATA, APS, uh, um, um, the uh, Philatelic Specialist Society of Canada, B BNAPS, the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada. Um, Zoom, it, its biggest strength is its biggest weakness, I think, um, in that uh, we are so Zoomed out right now. Um, during the first couple of years of the pandemic, I probably was involved in either speaking or listening to probably three or four Zoom sessions a week. I've limited it now down to about maybe one a month. Um, and I, I think Zoom fatigue and complacency is, 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 uh, is part for the course, but I think it's still a very, very important um, uh, tool that we need to uh, embrace and to um, take advantage of. Youth membership might be the, uh, one of the more important philatelic ap applications um, in, in terms of social media forms, mentorship, and the digital philatelist, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. Um, there are ways in which we can attract the young philatelist uh, through uh, digital philately. Here's an example of, of a stamp club from West Toronto, and this is their homepage. Very comprehensive. Um, the, the, the degree within which the uh, stamp club um, wants to share information is really um, limited by the imagination of the um, web host and, and the membership of the club. Uh, Digital Philatelist is a really cool, uh, this is their web page. Um, they have all sorts of different um, aspects on, on this page. For example, this is their home page. Uh, you can see here that they talk about collecting and countries and themes and, um, and software and applications, stamp dealers, YouTube, Facebook, using all the things that we're familiar with and, um, and using it to the philatelist's advantage. 
Um, you can provide opinions. Uh, there are popular uh, um, uh, uh, topics, news items, quick links, uh, different society links as well. And they, they use Instagram quite well uh, to share really um, uh, um, beautiful images of stamps as well as um, I'm sharing ideas. Uh, here's another one. A friend of mine, Ken Pugh, has, um, ha has set up for a few years now, he has 1.6 thousand members on stamp forgeries of any type in the world. And this is probably one of the most active um, discussion groups I've, I've seen to date. Um, people throwing up a stamp asking whether or not they think it's real or not, and if so, if, it, if it's a fake or forgery, who, who's responsible for, for um, uh, the fake or forgery. It is really a really cool website um, or, or a forum in uh, uh, Facebook. So anyone can um, basically uh, join on to this uh, um, uh, discussion and it's visible to anyone. So this Facebook form is not private. Exhibiting. Uh, here is an example. The American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors has um, hundreds um, of uh, exhibits, full on exhibits of a variety of topics. Um, and here is an example of the ways U.S. adhesive postage do stamps and their substitutes were used in 1879 to 1986, so almost a whole century of use of uh, postage due. So uh, it is a really cool way of, of, of uh, um, sharing information as well as getting ideas of, as to how you can, and, and not only that, uh, you'll see in the second one on the left-hand side there, it shows um, that uh, the highest award uh, offered. So you can use this as a way of getting a sense of, of, of what type of exhibits uh, score well. Here's another one. Um, this is an, ex you may not be familiar with this one. This is called ExpoNet. And uh, this is based in Europe. And it is a wonderful um, uh, exhibition platform for um, uh, um, a variety of different topics, primarily uh, European. But you'll see here in a moment that they have, uh, you'll, you'll see the, um, a, a whole host of different um, uh, a portal for philately. So the last slide here was ExpoNet, and uh, they link this to this thing called Stamp on the Web, which is a portal of philately by the AICPM. And you'll see on the right-hand side the different types of of, um, of of topics that are used. And ExpoNet has a thousand different um, items used. You can see that there on the top right-hand arrow, BNAPs. Um, and also uh, the Canadian Philatelic Society of Great Britain, you'll see all the different visitors from all over the world using stamps on the web uh, exhibits. And the website there is stamp, stampsontheweb.com. It's really worth going to. You can spend hours on this site alone. The other thing is research. And um, with, with regards to research, we have online resources, home tools, highly specialized tools, and census bureaus. So here's an example um, uh, of some re home tool research um, um, capabilities, including a scanner, an Epson Perfection V600 photo or higher. Uh, I, I find this one, to, Epson is to be the, the, the best for a variety of different reasons. You can, it's the law of diminishing returns when it comes to scanning. And you can talk to people who are at the Smithsonian that have scanners that are two, 300,000 ar archival um, um, scanners that cost, you know, um, scores of tens of thousands of dollars, two to $300,000. And you'll still will have people arguing about color. Um, I'm not as worried about that. I'm worried about sharing and collaborating. And the Epson Perfection V600 or higher, mine's about three, four years old now, cost me about $300 Canadian, about $250 American. And it is a great scanner. It does everything I need. Digital microscopes are now available. Um, I have an iPhone 13, and they began using macro lens technology, and it's just getting better and better, even under regular um, daylight or even um, uh, light in, a, in an indoor room. Uh, the iPhone can take images of stamps um, really, really well. I'll, I'll show you an example in a moment. 
There's different types of software that I'm going to highlight um, in the in the upcoming slides. Uh, Photoshop or low, lower Adobe versions um, is a really good imaging software. You can get free editor um, uh, capability with, with just Windows itself. Uh, PowerPoint. Over Zoom. Uh, oops, one second. Hello. Uh, oh, someone was speaking. Okay, now he's muted. Um, and so you can get, um, uh, just even if you're on a Mac, you, you can use Keynote and PowerPoint, and there are very good ways of, of presenting information. And I use PowerPoint for using a flip chart, which I, if I have time at the end, I'll show you what I mean by that. It's for identifying um, varieties quite quickly. Gwydion is a very cool uh, application that's free online. Photogrammetry is a great tool. And um, if you want to use a database, you can create your own, or you can use out-of-the-box stamp collection databases. Um, um, you can. Uh, there's one called Easy Stamp, which is very, very good. Um, it's a, a bit of a learning curve, but once you get it, it's awesome. And uh, or you could just use your own um, and create your own with Excel, for example. Um, here is uh, it, basically the image of the stamp that I collect, the Small Queen of Canada. And that is the exact scanner that I use. This is, this is, these are, th uh, basically it's one image. I took one image using an iPhone 14 or 13, and you can see how close and how accurate and clear that image is taken. And this was taken of a stamp of mine at my kitchen table with just regular kitchen light um, with my iPhone. Um, it's pretty darn good. The Gwydion freeware, um, you may want to write this down, Gwydion, and just search for it. I'm going to show you how to use it. It's really quite cool, especially for engraved stamps. Um, the Gwydion is the druid of the gods in wealth mythology. It was a wise god, master of illusion. And I think that's why they, they, they uh, have used this name. Or, um, and I, don't, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong because it's... Um, I, if anyone wants to correct me on the pronunciation of it, um, I, I call it Gwydion. Um, it's the, the helper of humankind, fighter against the greedy and small-minded, and supported the cultural arts and learning, tried to stamp out ignorance. So I think it's a perfect name for us philatelists. And there's the website, Gwydion.net. Um, it's a modular program for scanning probe microscopy data. It's a very powerful software for analysis of height fields grayscale image processing, leveling and filtering or grain marking functions. I'm going to show you the height field um, and, um, example. So the height fields are used for embossed or engraved stamps. Grayscale imaging, you're able to see things that magnification alone cannot. Overlays such as cancellations and overprints, which I'm going to show, and actually um, paper analysis. And this is important when you're looking at, for example, in, 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 in the topical world, whether or not um, certain caches and certain covers, um, uh, if you're looking for different paper types, that sort of thing. So there, if you go to Gwydion.net, you'll see this page and you click on the download. From there, you have a choice between Mac or Windows operating systems. And then if I'm, I'm in Windows, for example, today, so I'd click on that one. And then as soon as I uh, have downloaded and opened Gwydion, there you go. It's a very complex um, um, toolbar. But the key is to keep it simple. And, and what I'm showing you here is not get overwhelmed by all the icons. All you have to do is click on File and Open and select a stamp from your image library. And so that's what you do. And that's what I did there. I went to File. And there's my small clean two cent study. And I just clicked a, a stamp at random. And then I click open. From there, I see that uh, Gwydion has imported that stamp and has shown me some um, physical dimensions. And so I just click OK. And then I click on this uh, on the workspace area. And then I open a third workspace area, which displays a 3D view of data. And that's what that little green box is. It's the three-dimensional view. You wouldn't know that unless I showed it to you because there's so many different icons here. Like I said, I want to keep it simple for you. So you click on that, and then all of a sudden it takes you to this. The stamp, this engraved stamp, starts to become three-dimensional. And so the next thing I do with that 
is I click on this little uh, settings, uh, this little tool uh, bar, or this tool icon. And what it does is it allows me a, a variety of different things. The first thing is it allows me to open and expand the size of the image. So I click on that and then I take my um, uh, mouse and I'm, I'll show you what I do next is I enlarge this image. So I click on that little enlarge green item and then I place my cursor over the image workspace. I left click, hold and drag. And now I'm left with a much bigger Im image. And then I take the corner of my window and expand that even more. And now I'm left with a bigger image. So now I've gone from a stamp that's two dimensional and it's starting to look like a three dimensional stamp. Um, and what am I gonna do with it? What, what makes this important? Well, I'm gonna rotate the image using this um, little uh, device here, which is the, the, the little arrows, back and forth arrows. And I rotate it and I can rotate it right back into looking like what it was initially when I'm looking down as a two dimensional image. But then I'm gonna rotate it back to make it look like a three dimensional image if I want to. The next thing I want to do is change lighting. So I'm going to click on the lighting option here. And then all of a sudden, it's the software is starting to do things. It's starting to digitize the um, image. And once that's done, I'm going to adjust the light source. And when I say adjust the light source, what you're actually doing is you are creating, you are defining where your sunlight or where your pinpoint light will come from. Is it from below, which would be south, to the right, left, or above? And how high? It's really quite cool. And you can, you can have the sun setting, so you can have large shadows, you can have the sun quite high up and you have virtually no shadows at all. So that's what you're gonna do next by this light um, that is going to be um, basically a three dimensional uh, point in space where your, your light is going to be uh, directing from. And so you have the source direction angle bars. You just play with it. And then all of a sudden you start moving that. So I went 67 degrees light and then I went 61 degrees and all of a sudden I'm starting to see shadows in my engraved stamp that I wouldn't have seen before. And then I scale view as a whole, which is that um, icon there, that green thing again. I do that again, and then all of a sudden it starts giving me an option to do color. And Pearl is something that I like. The open GL default is the open is the default color, and pewter is another good um, color. But once you do that and start playing with your light and your your lighting and the uh, material color, you can really start seeing the stamp th that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. So once I've done that, I click overlay, and I'll show you what that is. That is. Um, um, just want to go back here, and then you make any light adjustments. So you click overlay there, which is the third icon down, and you make any light adjustments. And then this stamp starts to look like this, and it really, really looks as though it's embossed. It's it it it's it looks like it just came from the notary, and um and 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 it's a really wonderful way of looking for varieties and and in i can do all of this uh, with a little bit of practice after five or six times following the steps i just showed you and you can review this um on on the ata website once it's posted once you're able to do this within five or ten seconds you'll be able to see stamps like this from your um uh, stamp database Here's an example of something else that Gwydion can do. Uh, on, the green, on the orange stamp, you really can't see the, the year date under September 15th. And with Gwydion, you're able to identify the three quite easily, and it brings it out quite nicely using their filters. Here's another one um, where Gwydion was able to determine that this was a fake, um, that the double surcharge was a fake. What happened was, is that a collector had thought that he had a rare double surcharge on his Scott 139, but the N of Sense had a surcharge over top of the council that covered the two of the council. Um, and that obviously was a fake. And you can see that here, that the surcharge was over the original council. Um, and so uh, it was deemed uh, a fake. 
quite cool actually to be able to do that with the simple software. What I love about it is you can make that stamp, that green stamp on the left, look like this silver embossed stamp on the right. And you can identify these little pittings um, on the plate uh, so easily that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. It's quite impressive, actually. The next thing I want to talk to you about is photogrammetry. And this is a really cool philatelic application. Um, Photogrammetry, you're, I think we're all familiar with it. It appeared in the middle of the 19th century, almost in, sim simultaneously with the appearance of photography itself. The use of photographs to create topographic maps was first proposed by the French survey, survey of Dominique Arago in about 1840. The term photogrammetry was coined by the Prussian architect Albrecht Mindenbauer, which appeared in his 1867 article, Di Photogrammet, or Photomet photometrography and uh, the 19th century uses are stereo plotters to plot contour lines and topographic maps and to use um, um, 3d photography so here is a stereoscope that you'll you can see in antique shops with the stereo cards and here is a stereoscopic card uh, of le chateau de diable we're coming close to halloween so i thought that would be a good one to show you and Philatelic photogrammetry takes that basic information on those stereoscopic cards and allows us to um, compare similar postage stamps or similar covers. And this is very useful when you're looking at varieties, including um, uh, covers. Um, perhaps most of digital philately can be defined as variants of photogrammetry. And so here is the website from Dr. Simon Gronk of Victoria, Australia. It's a very easy um, um, uh, piece of software to use. Um, now, basically what I've been able to do is to basically do photogrammetry on a mass scale. And if we have time at the end of this talk, I can show you a, a very quick way that I've used photogrammetry as a flip chart to um, uh, look at uh, varieties, a thousand of them in a ma matter of 30 seconds. So what you do is when you open the photogrammetry uh, site, you will see this and you import your exemplar, which is basically your um, prototype stamp. And then what you'll do is you'll, um, when you import it, you'll basically define four different aspects, um, one, two, three, and four. So you'll notice here on the, um, the image of the stamp, you'll see a little, if you look carefully on the very top left hand corner, you'll see a green plus. What I did is I took my cursor and clicked um, the uh, number one at, on that corner. And then number two there on the top right hand corner is the red, the bottom left hand corner is the blue and the bottom right hand corner is the yellow, which you can't really see that well. But what I've done is I've defined the image as it's um, um, the, the basically what I've done is I've, I've um, what, are, what are those guys called when they plot, plot out your land um, when uh, uh, when you when you get your surveyor is basically what I'm doing here is a survey of the stamp like a surveyor would. And so the next thing I do is I do that again with another stamp on the right. And so you'll notice here that there is the, the, the perforations are a bit um, cloudy on the center one. What this is, is I've done I've, the, the stamp on the left is the exemplar. The stamp on the right is my comparative stamp that I've basically surveyed with the four points. And then I toggle using the little blue toggles at the top. And then I'm able to compare both stamps and I can see very quickly I, and I can identify varieties. And so this is great for the Franklin Washington series in the United States, for example. So that's a really cool free uh, site that you guys can use. Research and online resources, the Institute of Analytical Philately, a friend of mine, Richard Judge, um, is uh, very active in, with this institute. Uh, and if you go to their website, it's a very scientific aspect of digital philately. That's it's basically digital philately on steroids. Um, Bill Burden's web, uh, web space called WGB's Web Space by Bill Burden. He basically takes anatomy of stamps and um, is able to help identify 
um, and, and, and provide a database for um, people's collections, in particular um, 19th century Canadian stamps. If you're interested in university um, or an interest in, in mapping, uh, David Hobden from um, um, Milton, Ontario, uh, has given a great talk and it's available and if you, um, if you can always just in the chat, I can give you his, uh, the link of his talk uh, on, on mapping uh, using digital philately and then also philatelic storytelling um, using ancestry and newspapers.com. Really two good uh, ways of, of uh, adding more to your uh, topical collection. Um, Bill Burden space called WGB's web space. Um, He's a professional philatelic consultant, and what he's been able to do is, is um, he, his area also is like mine, the small queens, and he's able to use this aspect of computing to come up with a, 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 a basically a living textbook of uh, constant plate varieties, and you can do this with a variety of different um, areas of stamp collecting. Here's an enlargement of, of one, and he uses an, an anatomical reference of 2R3.1. And, and then, uh, um, then they're, basically it's a way of, uh, uh, it's a language that uh, like-minded people can use and, and compare when they're talking about stamps. Um, what I think is really interesting is genealogy and philately. And the world is literally at our fingertips, unlike it was before when we just had the uh, Encyclopedia Brit Britannica. We thought that we had it all, but we really have a lot more than we ever have had in the past. Um, I took a, a cover about a year ago and took it out of my box randomly. And I wanted to see if I could actually um, get some information out of this cover. So just by looking at it, I made a few notes. It's a two cent small queen cover. And there's three of them, double letter rate. Its origin was on May 1st, 1883 from Niagara, Canada West. The receiver was May 1st, 1883, so it didn't have to go far, Woodstock, Ontario. The addressee, and I couldn't really t tell what the writing was, in, in, um, and so I just guessed it was Francis Gale Esquire, county attorney. The cover on the right was reduced, Woodstock, Ontario. So that's the information I was able to receive. Um, just by looking at it. The reason I bought the cover is because you'll see that there is in the margin at the bottom left hand of the center stamp um, is, is what interested me in buying the cover was this um, uh, little bit of ink. And what I wanted to do is determine if this was a constant plate variety. But that's not the purpose of, of what I'm doing here. I want to know about this Francis Gale fellow. So on the back of it, it shows uh, the receiver. And there's some receiver notes. It might be the, uh, uh, and it says papers. It could have been a, um, uh, a court case between uh, a litigant and, and a defendant. Um, there's something legible at the bottom. So what I did is I went into Ancestry, but before I did that, I wanted to figure out what would be the good um, um, search term. So I went Francis Bale, County Attorney, Woodstock, Ontario, Niagara, 1883. And possibly the, the word stopper on the uh, on the back of, of that uh, cover. And those were going to be my search terms and see where I'd go with this. In Canada, we have ancestry.ca. In the US, it's .com. You can get monthly, half year, full year uh, subscription service. You can get free trial offers as well. And if you do the free trial offer, you basically have only the all access free uh, trial offer. I highly recommend that you cancel your offer or your free trial after 12 days or 13 days, because you will be dinged for the full year on day 14 or 15. So unless you're really into wanting to do this, but I, I, I encourage everyone to try um, using the uh, ancestry that belongs to your home country. And, um, and not only will you have access to that, you'll have access to newspapers.com. And if you're in the US, uh, Fold3 has an excellent military records database that they've curated um, for you through Ancestry. So I went to the Canadian version. I am Canadian, so I went to ancestry.ca and I entered my search terms, Francis Bale, and as I was entering Woodstock, it automatically went to Woodstock, Oxford, Ontario, Canada, Oxford being the county. And so as soon as I did that, um, you can see the search filters. 
I went broad on Francis. I didn't go as broad on Bale because I wasn't sure um, how if it was if, if it was or was not the real name. And 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 I I should have gone exact on Woodstock, but I didn't. And lo and behold, I get a Francis Ball of Ontario in Woodstock, and there's the 1891 cens census data. And I clicked on that the the middle. Uh, highlighted one. I clicked on 1891 Census uh, of Canada. Keep in mind that what I'm showing you here took me no more than 10 minutes to do, and I'm a novice in this area. Within a minute, I was able to find that Francis Ball in 1881 was married, age 53, born in 1828, Presbyterian Church of Canada, Scottish nationality, is a barrister, which which is consistent with the uh, cover of the uh, um, 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 uh, piece that I was showing earlier, and he's from Oxford, Woodstock, or Woodstock, Oxford, and so aha, so I, I know that I'm in the right right area, and so if I scroll down that page, I see who's in his household, and at that time there were many people. Not only was Francis Ball, it wasn't Gail, it's actually Ball. There's Agnes, Andrew, Isabel, Robert, Emily, Florence, uh, Jesea, Margaret, William, and Mary. And what's interesting is you have the two, they, they may have been um, people that lived and were workers at the, uh, maybe a butler or a, uh, a maid uh, at, at the bottom there, 18 and 24 years of age. But what interests me is is where is the mother here because agnes would, would not have been eight years old when she had andrew so um, what interests me is who is agnes is this is this a, a child of francis's is this a cousin is this a niece is this a spouse so the next thing i take a look at is i on that same page, I click on Francis Ramsey Ball on deaths and um, on, and his death certificate. So within minutes now, I'm looking at his death certificate, and I can highlight certain things here. He died in the top right-hand corner. He died of gangrene of the leg, um, and he had that for 11 days, and he was a widower And uh, when he died. And... Uh, uh, and that would suggest to me that he outlived his second wife, which I'll, I know it's a second wife, but I didn't know at the time that it was the second wife. And uh, he was, his, his birth was in uh, uh, Niagara, and uh, he was a barrister on 219 Van Sitter Avenue. So I got a lot of information about his death. And... Uh, and then what I did now is I went back to the original search and I went exactly, instead of a broad search, I went to exact search of Francis Ramsey Ball. And because I know that's the guy that I'm interested in. And as soon as I click on that, I get his actual birth date and his actual date of death, November 5th, 1827 and January 27th, 1913. And not only do I get that information, I'm actually now going to search his birth date to that exact date, but sometimes these dates are a bit off. So I went plus or minus a year. And now I'm getting more information. Um, I'm looking at the certificate of marriage for Francis Ramsey Ball. So this might help me with that original uh, family list in the household of that census. And so you see here that Agnes is a spouse. And Agnes could not have had a child at the age of eight. So it's most likely that Francis Ramsey Ball had a second spouse named Agnes. So now what I want to do is I want to look at their marriage certificate. And there it is, the one on the left-hand column. And when you look at that, you can see here in, in close-up detail that Francis was at the age of 42. He was a widower already at the age of 42, and he married Agnes from Niagara, where Francis is originally from, where he's born, and at, at age 22. So was, was, was she uh, a male, um, uh, what, what do we call a, um, uh, a male bride? Um, and uh, she was of the Free Church, Church of England. So the next thing I do is I look at the public archives for that period, and lo and behold, I see that Francis Ball 
have these people in his uh, uh, home. And this is from the year of, what year is that now? Uh, this is, I'm going to go back here. Uh, and this is a census from 1861. And if you look at this 1861 census information, you can see that Agnes is, is not in the picture and that he's married to another uh, lady here under his name, uh, F or M Ball. And they live in Otterville, which is outside of the, the, the county limits. And so I have no idea where Otterville is in Ontario. And so what I did is I just went to my iPhone right away and it clicked in Otterville on my phone. And all of a sudden, it, um, well, Norfolk County is what I entered um, on the map section of, uh, of um, my iPhone. And there was Norfolk County. And it's near Niagara, so I know it's in the right spot. So now all I do is I start zooming in. And as I zoom in, I'm looking for outside of the county limits, and there's Otterville. So here is a census that was done in 1851 where, um, for Otterville, and, um, and it's just outside of the county limits. So this is where they lived on their farm. The next thing I do is go to the obituary records of newspapers.com. And now that I know his name, all I do is I go Francis Ramsey Ball, and I'm, I'm looking for anything that would be in the newspapers. And the first thing that comes on my search is the obituary record for Francis Ramsey Ball. Now, keep in mind, at the time, Montreal and Quebec had very limited ability to communicate um, in, in, in the 1900s, uh, very uh, primitive means, uh, telephone, tele, te teletype, that sort of thing. And he died on January 27th, and this was already published in the Montreal Gazette in print the next day in Montreal, um, his obituary. So that is the actual uh, image of the obituary record, and I'll read it to you. Woodstock, Ontario, January 27, Francis Ramsey Ball, one of the oldest barristers in the province, died at his home early this morning, aged 85. For 40 years, he was the County Crown Attorney of Oxford and assisted in the prosecution of Virchow for the murder of Benwell over 20 years ago. Years ago, he ran for South Oxford in the reform interest and was defeated by the late Honorable Hefferington Connor by only one vote. Deceased kept a diary, largely his own experience, partly furnished from recollections supplied by parents, which is a valuable record of the military and political history of the province for the last hundred years. That, that namely would be the province of Ontario. So that's a copy of, of, of the uh, obituary. Now, what I did is then I just did a regular Microsoft Bing um, a search and I went Francis Ramsey Ball diary because at the obituary talks about his diary and there was 4.6 million results. But you'll notice that this was automatically curated by the search engine. And the second item was the Ball family, family history manuscript. And so I clicked on that and that's um, on the ourontario.ca. Uh, it is a uh, archival um, uh, um, a website that um, provides a lot of great information. So I clicked on it and lo and behold, there were about 18 different pages of Francis Ramsey Ball's um, diary of his family history and military history in Ontario. That was the last page here. And at the bottom, it says written by Francis, Francis Ramsey Ball, Woodstock, Ontario. So basically, I looked at this cover using ancestrynewspapers.com and a basic internet search focusing on the diary. And within 10 minutes, actually, this summary took me longer than the research um, to write. So Francis Ramsey Ball for 40 years was the Crown Attorney for the County of Oxford in Woodstock, Ontario. He was one of approximately 50 Queen's Council appointees in the province during this period. He was born in Niagara on November 25th, 1827 to William and Margaret Ball of Scottish descent. He was married twice and outlived his wives, both of whom died relatively young. He lived on a farm in Otterville, 15 miles southeast of Woodstock, had three children from his first marriage and was a member of the Free Church. He remarried at age 42 to 
Agnes, also from Niagara, 20 years his junior. He had four more children with Agnes. Francis became a member of the Presbyterian Church of Canada upon marrying Agnes. They were married for 18 years before she died at the age of 40. He was a reformist and was narrowly defeated by one vote in the provincial election. After suffering 11 days of gangrene on the, of the left leg, Francis died on January 27, 1913, at the age of 85, at his home on 219 Van Sittert Avenue in Woodstock. For some time prior to his death, Francis suffered from senile decay. The original house no longer remains. I checked on Google Maps. He kept a diary highlighting the military and political history of Ontario from this 18th and 19th centuries from the accounts oral history of his father and grandfather. Family and personal stories are also shared in this 30 page narrative. The diary rests in the Ontario government archives. So all of that from a cover I randomly pulled out of a box at home and in 10 minutes I was able to get that information. That is a very good uh, example of digital philately using uh, um, that type of research. You can also use digital philately for selling and trading, like I said, organizing your collections, writing articles and publishing, sharing and collaboration and presentation. Uh, census bureaus is something very important as well. And this is when you have maybe one or two very interesting covers, for example, on a particular topic, and you don't know whether other people have it. Well, you would use um, platforms such as Facebook or the ATA or the American Philatelic um, uh, uh, Society. You can use a variety of different um, uh, mechanisms of way of collaborating with people using the Census Bureau to gather data. Um, and for example, uh, here's Wayne Smith's a census of early covers and cancels of the Canada Pence issue and, he, um, and also of the Canada Sense issue and the census of large queens covers by rates. And um, he uses uh, this platform as a way of, 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 of collaborating with other people uh, who have similar covers. So that is really what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, how are we for time?